Hello folks, welcome to another upload, and today we're going to be trying something a bit different. Now you guys know that I fucking love Mega Man X, but watching some Lost Media videos sort of got me interested in the development of some of these games. Even for games known for their short development times, a lot can change during the creation of a video game. Content and ideas are inevitably going to change or even get removed, which is what I'm here to look at. This obviously isn't Lost Media by any means, not anymore. And I'm not here to document the finding of these or anything, I'm strictly looking at these in a comparative light. Also worth mentioning that any possible story differences would be beyond me because all these demos are Japanese and I can't understand that language, although I doubt that'd be a factor. Why would you work on a game before having a story, right? Before we begin, I'd like to thank Brian, also known as ProtoDude, for providing me the links to a lot of these games. Guy runs a Mega Man blog, Rockman Corner, so check it out if you're curious. Thanks a bunch, video wouldn't be possible without him. Anyway, without further interruption, let's get started. Okay, so where better to begin than with Mega Man X4? A simple game compared to some of its processes with a damn fine action game all the same. There are two X4 prototypes we'll be looking at, one for the all too iconic PlayStation release and one for the Saturn version. Considering the PlayStation's origins are more well known and it's a less complete version of the game, we'll be starting with that one. This build of the game is dated May 1997, about three months before the game came out, and is notable for being included on a special trial disc that also contained demos of Mega Man 8 and Mega Man Battle and Chase, a racing spin-off I've never played, sorry to say. The game begins with the intro stage, which is identical to the final game, but after that we see a whole world of differences. Right off the bat, half the game's stages aren't accessible, despite the preview images that display them being present. It's not possible to select them. Of the available stages, half of them have an ambiguous blacked out maverick icon that indicates that there's no boss in the stage, the other two have their normal icons. Each of the stages have a varying amount of differences. Starting with the two bossless stages, Jet Stingray stage has two differences, one of which is the color and durability of the flying enemies that appear in the stage. They take more damage and are green and purple, as opposed to the orange color they sport in the final game. The other difference is in the final part of the stage, which contains a much smaller opening to the final area before the boss. The final game is much less unforgiving. Despite Jet Stingray himself appearing in the stage as usual, he isn't fought. Magma Dragoon's trademark enemy was the cannon enemies, and here they function the same but look drastically different. The fireballs that pop up from the ground are absent, as are the ride armor enemies. The ride armor is placed early in the stage, and the bursts of fire that appear in the last section before the boss are gone. Instead, there are bats and other enemies here. Okay, now for the two far more interesting stages, Frost Walrus and Web Spider. Both stages contain very interesting differences in their final counterparts. Walrus' stage contains quite a few interesting locations, and in what seems to be a result of undecided item placement. Few areas of the stage were cut, and an inaccessible part of the stage seems to have been a potential heart tank location. The block resembles the one blocking the heart tank in the final game, which is further supported by the fact that the final heart tank placement is not there in the prototype. The EX tank location also seems to have been blocked off. Web Spider's stage, on the other hand, contains something pretty unique as far as these prototypes go, an unused enemy, a gold version of the octopus battery. The enemy looks similar to the red version in the game, but behaves totally different. It's indestructible, but will freeze upon getting hit. And it moves pretty similarly to the red one, which both sport altered patterns in the final game. Obviously, the gold ones are nowhere to be seen in X4. The stage has some level design differences, namely in the final climb before the end of the section. Now, Spider himself has some pretty notable key differences to his incarnation in the official release. I already made a video showcasing the fight, but for those who weren't able to pick up on the differences shown off, there are two major ones here. Prototype Web Spider's Lightning Web will track X's position, but it will not move from its path once it begins moving. More importantly, after losing about a fourth of his health, Spider gains a new attack, the ability to fire off two lightning webs, something he will continue to do even once he begins his second phase. This succeeds in making the fight, well, still piss easy, but it's a lot more involved and way more fun than the fight in the final game. This demo shows off quite a lot of interesting differences, which certainly makes it an odd playthrough, and the Saturn version actually doesn't deviate too much from it. I actually had to set up a Sega Saturn emulator for the first time to play this, and the only major thing that the Saturn version had, which was absent in the PS1 trial disc, is the presence of a fifth stage slash beast. While near identical in design, it's missing the ride armor enemies just like Magma Dragoon stage, and there's a lot of misplaced crates and a much more durable mini-boss. 
Both these builds allow X access to a few weapons and zero his Raijin Geki, which allows you to do something not possible in the final game using weapons in the intro stage on Egregon, the intro boss. It's also worth noting that both versions use the weapon get music from the final game for the stage select, and both games are completely lacking in story elements. No FMVs, Double and Iris aren't present in the stage select screen, Colonel doesn't appear in the intro stage, nor does Magma Dragoon, and X is unable to reach the Memorial Hall fight with Colonel even after being four stages. Also, there's this real funny game over screen in the trial disc version where Zero advertises the game. That's pretty charming. Although neither demo allows us to play through the entirety of the game, so we'll never be able to see what every element of the game looked like during development, there are still some pretty fascinating insights into early versions of X4. Alright, X3. Not the most streamlined game, but for this video it's going to be an introduction of prototypes that are essentially early versions of the completed games, as opposed to the demos we saw with X4. This time we've got three prototypes to look at, all for the Super Nintendo version, although two are based on the same build. These come from August 9th and August 25th respectively, and have minimal differences between each other. The cutting room floor speculates that August 25th version is likely a demo version sent to kiosks, while the August 9th version was seen in an issue of EG. Despite both versions allowing the player to access every level and boss in the game, there's a multitude of differences and incomplete elements shown off. Now, each stage has its fair share of differences. Some stages have different textures, and others have modified backgrounds. Toxic Seahorse's stage is missing its mini-boss entirely, and Tono Rhino's stage has the sand dropping machines that appear in the stage present at the beginning, but they don't do anything. Where Prototype X3's differences really begin to show is in the bosses. Three bosses out of the eight, Vault Catfish, Blizzard Buffalo, and Neon Tiger, have a completely different set of sprites, which seem to just be hastily put together placeholders given that their proper designs are already present on the boss select screen. These sprites are freaky, they're much more cartoony and less detailed in animation, but the attacks and patterns are mostly the same, albeit with a few differences. Vault Catfish's idiotically simplistic second phase is mostly the same, but for some reason whenever he positions himself he does it off-center, as opposed to charging up in the middle the screen. It doesn't really change the battle from being an overly specific pain in the dick. Blizzard Buffalo can't be faked out, and his icicles act a bit different too. There's quite a lot of subtle differences in his behavior, like how hugging the wall will prompt him to constantly ram it instead of dashing back and firing icicles, although the desperation attack is still intact. I'm not sure which one is more brain dead. Neon Tiger has all his attacks and a design that's even more fucking ridiculous, and his race splasher is twice as fast in this prototype, which makes him a fucking pain in the dick, way harder than in the final game. Even the non-select screen bosses look much different. Bit and Bite sport completely different designs, which follow the standard of being much bulkier with brighter colors and an overall cartoonier look. Speaking of those two numbnuts, it's actually the most interesting part of the prototype in my opinion. Like in the final game, once you beat 8 Mavericks, you unlock access to Doppler's Fortress. One of X3's gimmicks is that you can alter the final stages by killing Bit, Bite, and Bile. This isn't possible in the prototype, and as a result, the alternate stages aren't accessible by normal means. God Car Machine O Inary looks completely different, and oddly enough he takes way more damage from the buster. In order to fight the press disposer, you need to use a level select code. Then there's Doppler Stage 2. Now what really interested me about this stage was that on a normal playthrough of the game, meaning one where Vile does not die, the stage is in its non-damaged state, and the enemies that populate the stage are the pink gun robot, not to mention you fight both Korogyle at the end. In the final game, the stage is completely different if Vile is left alive. The Vile destroyed version of the stage can only be accessed through an action replay code and contains a modified Vile fight, where the right armor phase is a new attack, he'll lunge at X and then jump, and he also deals significantly less damage. Also, I should have mentioned this before, but Vile's factory is also present, mostly unchanged with the exception of the elevators that normally only work if Vault Catfish is dead now never working, no matter if the conditions are fulfilled or not. In the August 25th build, the game ends after completing Doctor Stage 2, further supporting that this is a demo build. A demo build where you can play all but two levels of the game, an interesting way to advertise your game. The August 9th build contains an unfinished Doppler Stage 3, where the boss refight room contains 4 extra capsules, which I thought would lead to refights with Bit, Bite, and Vile, but they simply don't function at all, and the Doppler fight is identical to the final game aside from some graphical changes. The final stage of the game has a different background with Neo Sigma, the first form of the dickhead from X2 can be seen as opposed to the sprite used in the final game, and Sigma's design is 
a bit bulky, but actually more accurate to how he looked in X2 and X1, with animations that are a lot more detailed. Kaiser Sigma has an unfinished design, which results in a taller looking battle body, and his fight is clearly unfinished. The boss is usually hurt by a charge shot to the head, but here there's no head. His hitbox seems to have been placed near his legs, so hitting the thing by normal means is essentially impossible. I had to use a cheat code to beat him and experience the rising lava section and ending. The ending actually can't be accessed in normal means, but TCRF screenshots indicate that it's relatively similar, so has some positioning differences. Overall, this build, while similar in many respects, contains so many interesting differences from the final game. And what's even more interesting is that in the September prototype, which is dated only a month later, all of these things seem to have been changed to resemble what they are in the final game, and the build is practically identical to the official release. Now, although TCRF has helped me to pen some of the script, a lot of the changes I've noted on all these games are just things that I can recognize on my own. But I genuinely can't find a difference between this build and the final game. Regardless, though, X3's many graphical changes certainly were a sight to see. I think it's really cool seeing how, even with minimal design changes, X3 can still seem like a very different game. Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, all three of these builds had that elevator section at the end of Doppler Stage 2, confirming that that section was willingly added, and not a joke portion implemented by the developers in a drunken stupor during the last week of development. Crazy, I know. So by now we've looked at X4, which had two demo-like prototypes that showed off a few stages, and X3, which had three prototypes that showed off an early version of every element seen in the final game. Mega Man X5, the focus of this segment, will showcase two prototypes that sort of fall into both categories. X5 is one of my favorite Mega Man games of all time, and as Capcom's most ambitious title in the franchise as far as the classic side-scrollers go, there's lots of differences to see. Starting with the first, this build is dated May 2000, and like with the Trial Disc X4 build, only contains four conventionally playable stages. As you might be aware, X5 was built off the engine of X4, and because of that, there are lots of remnants of X4 in both of these builds, but it's way more noticeable here. Well, for one, you can't even select your character before starting a stage. Whoever you choose before the intro stage is who you're stuck with, and more importantly, you can't select Unarmored X, the fourth armor is the default. This build also sports a vastly different health bar, life counter, and virus gauge bar designs, as well as a different character select screen. The prototype begins with the intro stage, which already contains a few noticeable differences. For one, completely different sprites for the Mad Taxi and small cannon enemies. They look way different, and way less detailed for that matter. It's also real easy to notice here that there's absolutely no trace of Alia, mostly because it's a lot more fun playing through the stage without having to smack buttons every 5 or so seconds to skip all her dialogue. The intro stage's layout is mostly unchanged, including the fight with Sigma, but once you reach the boss select screen, you're given access to four stages. Burn Dino Rex, Alt Kraken, Tidal Whale, and Crescent Grizzly, and each have varying amounts of changes. Grizzly stage is mostly different thanks to having the highest presence of the Mad Taxis, and I find that their smaller sprites makes them a bit easier to jump over. It also seems to contain a ceiling coded in during the truck sections, because it's not possible in this build to make some jumps due to the fact that you can't jump out of the screen, which is, uh, really annoying. The boss is practically the same as the final. This prototype has no armor parts or heart tanks, which is evidenced by the fact that Vault Kraken stage lacks the blue orbs at the ride chaser section. The stage itself is mostly unchanged except for a few enemies that in the final game only appear in extreme mode, and interestingly, very different beta designs for the replids that can be rescued in the stage. Here are the more interesting changes to the boss himself. Generally known as the biggest pain in the ass out of the eight, there's quite a few subtle changes made to Kraken. For one, his attack speed is much slower, both when firing the Tri-Thunder and when he electrifies the floor. There's about a good 2 or 3 second delay between him punching the floor and the electricity appearing. For two, his movement is a lot less free-flowing, because he'll practically tail x Zero before firing his Tri-Thunder, as opposed to the final game where he usually drifts away before firing. It's a bit hard to explain. He also transitions into his desperation attack way slower, in the final game it's near instant. For third, he has an attack that seems to have been cut from the final, where he spawns two of the blocks that he normally spawns only one of in the final. It's actually a neat attack, and I wish they kept it in the final game as like an extreme mode exclusive attack, but it does seem to conflict with some aspects of the battle, and I can see how it'd be a bit annoying to tweak considering they ramped up Adler's speed for the final. Dino Rex and Whale stages are mostly the same as the final. Dino Rex himself isn't present in this game, and Whale's battle is a bit different. During his desperation phase, instead of firing ice blocks that push you towards spikes, he doesn't switch sides, so the ice blocks push you towards the wall. 
They're also way faster. Now, one of the most interesting parts of this prototype is the music. X5 is pretty well known for having quite a few cut tracks, most notably a completely original piece made for Tidal Whale Stage that was replaced by a remix of Bubble Crab's theme from X2. However, in this prototype, the theme can be heard in this stage, suggesting that this track and others were cut pretty late into development, considering that X5 was presumably being worked on since X4's completion and release in 1997. This is some pretty fascinating insight, but there doesn't seem to be anything online about why these tracks were removed, so you got me on that one. In general, there's a lot of music here that sounds vastly different from the final, but Whale Stage is the only one whose music was entirely replaced. Why? I guess we'll never know. This X5 prototype had a timer, but it's set at 24 hours and nothing happens if it ticks down, so that's the end of that. Or it would be, if not for the power of action replay. As it turns out, there is indeed data for the four remaining Maverick stages and a few others in the game. Shining Firefly, Spiral Pegasus, and Dark Necrobat all have their stages appear in incomplete fashion. Most of the stages use placeholder generic graphics, with the exception of Firefly, but his stages graphics are super incomplete. All three of the stages cannot be finished, so there's not much to talk about. The tutorial stage and Spike Rose Red stages are both complete in terms of layout, and while the tutorial remains mostly the same, it's Rose Red whose stage is a lot more interesting. It poses a lot of visual differences, enemy placement that's modified in the final game, the heart tank location isn't blocked off and can be accessed by X or Zero, and most notably, Rose Red is nowhere to be seen, but there is a placeholder boss fight, a battle against Split Mushroom, likely just a small in-joke considering that they both have the ability to clone themselves. Interestingly, this build also has leftover stages from X4, Spaceport which contains an early version of Dynamo's theme, Final Weapon, Memorial Hall, and the final stage. None of them can be played to any real extent, so they're possibly just remnants of data left over from X4. Anyway, it's time to get into the July 2000 prototype, which is less like a demo and more like an incomplete version of the final game. Indeed, every stage in X5 is included in this prototype, as is every boss fight and many core mechanics of the game. First thing to point out is the cutscenes, many of which are incomplete and represented by crude MS Paint style drawings, others have different color correction or shading that doesn't line up with the visual style. X and Zero, as well as X's armors can be selected before any stage regardless of who you select at the beginning, and collectibles like heart tanks and armor parts have been added. The remaining four stages are also added and are definitely the main talking point as far as stage design, since the four stages in the May 2000 build are pretty much the same as they were in that build. Worth noting is that this build seems to have selectable difficulties, but I tried it on all three and I didn't notice a difference. It might just be me. The eight stages are all pretty much identical to how they appear in the final game. Ignoring a few visual changes and some minor enemy placement modifications, all eight stages are practically complete, with minute changes to mechanics. One that immediately comes to mind are multiple different sprites and backgrounds. Dino Rex is stage having a few Sigma viruses that are removed in the final game and most notably, Firefly stage is way harder because the energy blasts that come from the prism guards in the last part of the stage fire way faster. Seriously, this is a fucking pain. Some of the bosses contain a few changes, namely in their speed. This is most obvious with Spike Rose Red and Burn Dino Rex, who is already the fastest boss in the game, but he moves way faster here and so does Rose Red. That's small stuff though as this build contains not only every level from the final, but just about every mechanic. There's way more to talk about here. The part system is here and works identically to the full game, although there's no visual indicators to which part to obtain. Funnily enough, this build also comes with the debug mode activated via the select button, which allows you to give X or zero hearts, sub tanks, parts, and do funny shit like activate a no hit mode. Now, I wasn't sure if the bad ending was still intact, as on my playthrough of this build, I got the enigma to destroy the colony, but both X and Zero's endings are intact, rest assured. Zero virus stage blue and purple are actually pretty similar to how they appear in the final, with blue sporting no significant differences, and purple having a few missing crushers, but structure-wise it's the same. The bosses, though, appear to have been changed quite a lot. Shadow Devil in this prototype is one absolutely brutal deviation. In the final game, he creates a green outline of himself that damages X or Zero a lot upon contact from the side he's on. In this build, he creates an outline on both sides of the screen, leaving you with a very small portion of the screen to dodge. Fuck that. Rangda functions mostly the same, with two big differences. His red eyes attack, which is already nigh impossible to dodge in the game without upgrades, travels in the opposite direction, making unarmored X and Zero incapable of dodging it. He also has a different version of his desperation attack. In the final game, he sprouts spikes out of the wall he forces you to dance around. In this prototype, he does... 
that. Yeah, that. Fuck. Fire Stage Red has a part that you cannot pass that in Air Dash, which was changed in the final. But the fights with Zero or X are the same. The final stage, besides sporting some different colors, is mostly the same up until Sigma, who sports some different spreads for the waves he fires at half health and UGH! What is that? And it seems that while the same model is used for Sigma's second form, the angle it's at is totally different, leading to a boss that sort of just awkwardly floats in the right portion of the screen, while in the final he takes up the entire screen. Probably has Beta Sigma indeed. His electrical orbs are a different color, but the attacks are mostly the same. Also worth mentioning that even though the Shadow Devil and Rang the Boss themes, as well as X vs Zero and Sigma's first form theme are in the game, both of Sigma's fights use the normal boss fight theme. Rangda's theme plays over the Shadow Devil fight, and for some reason, the Shadow Devil theme plays over the credits, which is just all sorts of mood whiplash. Still, for a prototype dated so close to the game's release, the amount of differences is pretty shocking. While a similar experience overall, it's pretty crazy what a few months of polish can do, this was easily my favorite set of prototypes to look at because of the incredibly interesting ways it deviated from the final game while still being very close to it in a lot of ways. We sure have talked a lot about X, huh? I wasn't able to find many prototypes for any series outside of X, but to break up the monotony just a tad, let's look at a sample version of Mega Man 7, a game I actually sort of like despite its flaws in being just an unspectacular game. This is a sample version of the game given out to gaming magazines and is dated about 4 months before the game's Japanese release. Similar to the X4 PS1 trial disc build, this demo contains 4 out of the 8 stages found in the game. Unlike that build, this version actually contains a lot of unfinished content from the final game that can be accessed via cheat codes, so we can look at this build on more than just face value. This sample contains 4 stages, but before that is an intro stage that is vastly different from the final, beyond just the lack of the long ass unskippable cutscenes. The stage is full of crumbling platforms that were removed, and also seems to house enemies from Cloudman's stage that also got taken out. The battle with the base is the same as the final. Cloud Man, Freeze Man, Junk Man, and Slash Man all have their stages available to play, although as the stage icons might suggest, the bosses of these stages are nowhere to be seen. To get the least changed stage out of the way, let's talk about Slash Man first. His stage received pretty minimal changes as far as layout goes, which is to view changes to the platform dinosaur sections before the mini boss, being the only notable removal. The mini boss of the stage doesn't have programmed AI, so we've sort of just stands there taking your shots. Junkman's stage got multiple background changes made to drive the whole garbage factory aesthetic across more. In the prototype, it does look a bit too clean for a boss called Junkman. The elevator section has no enemies, and the vertical climb with the ladders doesn't have those rising platforms. Instead, it's got helicopter enemies who received heavy respriting in the final. Also worth mentioning is that there are way less ladders here two in the sample, while the final game has four. The area with the trash snakes doesn't have those awful helicopter platforms, instead having the countdown platforms. And last but not least, the area with the S letter is not accessible into this build due to the lack of obtainable freeze cracker. Speaking of which, Freeze Man's stage is mostly just visual and background changes, sporting lots of modified backgrounds and some sections that had layers of ice added to the floor. The section with the icicle dropping enemies also had its difficulty toned down in the final by removing one of the enemies from the section. Cloud Man, following suit, features different backgrounds and a few enemies that aren't present in the final, like the tire stacking enemies. The three most noteworthy aspects of the stage are 1. The invisible platform section where the platforms only show up while Mega Man is on them are now fully visible. 2. You cannot modify the weather of the stage by using any weapons. 3. Proto Man does not appear in this stage at all. It's also worth mentioning, none of the stages have their proper music except for Cloud Man. Junk Man gets Turbo Man's theme, Freeze Man gets Slash Man's theme, etc. etc. One interesting thing about this prototype is that Mega Man in this build has the super adapter by default. Here it functions the same, but with no transformation sequence. For some reason it also supports Turbo Man's palette before he transforms into Super Mega Man. The rest of Mega Man's arsenal isn't available in the game at all, although some are present in the code and can be used with cheat codes. Now all this stuff may not seem that interesting, but it's with cheat codes that we can view into some of the more hidden secrets of this prototype. Let's start with Burst Man and Turbo Man, which here are test stages that barely resemble the final. No intact graphics, no enemies, no nothing. Turbo Man's stage is at least mostly complete in terms of layout, before the mini boss at least. Burst Man's stage? Uh, yeah. 
Spring Man and Shade Man stages are also available, and while they have graphics that suggest they're a bit more complete, they still very much lack what made them unique in the final. Shade Man stage is full of placeholder enemies from Freeze Man stage. Some enemies from the final stage appear, but they're few and far between. Despite this, the layout is mostly the same, with one big exception. Now in the final, you fight a pumpkin robot as a mid-boss, but here it's totally different. This machine is nowhere to be seen in the final game, but he could have been an inspiration for the boss of the Robot Master Museum in the final game, as they're both rotund robots that can only be harmed on their head. He rams the wall and dashes towards you, sort of like the pumpkin boss from the final, but there doesn't seem to be any alternate way to beat him. The boss in the final has two different methods of beating him, and each unlocks a different path, but I can only find one way to defeat him, so some of the stage I couldn't experience. Also, they use Cloud Man's theme, and it doesn't even have that little cutscene where Mega Man looks at the moon. Lame. That's better than Spring Man's stage, though. I know I said it had graphics that resembled the final stage, and it sort of does, but it's very, very rough. I don't even know how to describe it, honestly. It's still got the factory aesthetic, but with darker colors and less cutesy background elements. The level's layout is practically identical, but every spring in the stage doesn't work, the punching glove boxes that appear near the end aren't here, and it seems to have border issues too. The black space of nothingness that appears outside the walls can be seen and the camera isn't set either. Also, Spring Man's stage doesn't appear. Instead, it's Cloud Man's track. Again, they must really like that track. It's very cool, honestly. I wasn't expecting much from this sample considering that Mega Man 7 supposedly had a very short development time and it doesn't really stand out much as a game. But there's a genuinely surprising amount of shit that I wasn't expecting here, which made this a very fun look at. Alright, now it's time for the juicy shit. This game was the entire reason I wanted to make this video in the first place. Mega Man X6, the fucking blight of my soul. And yes, it does indeed have a prototype version available on the internet, dated September 2001. Although this build is similar to the final game in many ways, there's also a shit ton of differences to talk about, some of which are genuinely shocking and kind of give light to this game's fucked up development. If those words have lost meaning to you, especially considering that I've probably said them at least a dozen times in the script, just know that it's infinitely more poignant here. Where do I even start? Well, let's start with the level design. One thing I noticed playing this was that there seemed to be a lot more nightmares. It was really weird, and it took me a bit to realize what was going on as I played through it. The crazy sons of bitches who developed this game, when they put together the utter hell that is extreme mode in this game, they made it the default. This prototype does indeed have multiple difficulties, and I will go over what they changed later, but just know that many of the sections here were eventually changed for normal mode in the final game. Just as an example, on normal mode, this section in Rainy Turtloid stage has a giant purple enemy in the prototype. In the final game's normal mode, this enemy isn't here, but it is here in the final game's extreme mode. As a result, there aren't a lot of flat out level design changes to talk about, so I don't have as many direct level design changes to discuss. Most of it is still intact in the final game, just on extreme mode. And that being said, there's still a few things that saw changes from the final, but they're few and far between. And I'm so glad for that, because it gives me the opportunity to talk about the leagues of Weird X6 exclusive shit that pops up here. Like the weapons, which have some absolutely fucking bizarre issues. For whatever reason, while every weapon, palette, and icon is intact, they're all switched around. For example, the Yamar option coats X in green and yellow, but here it's got the light blue palette used for the Ice Burst. Ice Burst has Guard Shell's pink color scheme, etc, etc. It seems Metal Anchor is the only weapon to have its proper palette. The shark is amazingly lucky when it comes to not getting fucked over by this game's development. The two most radically different weapons are Guard Shell and Ray Arrow, or should I say, Glitchy Wing Spiral from X5. Indeed, the Ray Arrow does not make an appearance here. Instead, we have a remnant of X5, the weapon of Spiral Pegasus, Wing Spiral. It acts the same but with fucked up visuals. Then there's the Guard Shell, but it's not the normal version I want to talk about, it's the charged version. It's completely different here, and instead of creating four large shells that fire wildly inaccurate projectiles, it creates a Guard Shell that bounces around the screen. This is hilariously powerful and it makes short work of enemies. Multiple unfinished assets can be seen, 
Every boss intro is unfinished and either aren't shaded properly or use rough sketches. The part system and rescue replit screen also use rough sketches of what they would have looked like in the final. And interestingly, we can see drawings of X's two armors which look a bit different than they do in the final game. One of the most interesting changes to this prototype is the nightmares. Everyone's favorite Lovecraftian horrors are known for being incredibly difficult to deal with on extreme mode because they not only gain access to a teleportation attack that's just fucking ridiculous, but they also have more health. Here's the terrifying part. On the normal mode of this build, their final game extreme mode health is the default. And I shit you not, on this prototype's extreme mode, these motherfuckers have even more health. Literally, they take a charge shot and three shots to kill. And just the idea of dealing with this bullshit in the final game just makes me want to fucking vomit. Ugh. The bosses. Plenty of changes seen here. First off, like with the stages, extreme mode changes to the bosses are implemented, although they seem pretty different. In some cases, attacks that were a difficulty universal like Infinity Majinion's charged ray arrow where he slams his ass into the ground is now only used by him on extreme. Speaking of that little fucker, he actually doesn't clone himself in this prototype, likely just something they didn't implement in time for the build considering that cloning was his gimmick from the beginning, but oh man, I can't even describe how good it feels to see this bastard fall so easily, although his other horse shit from the game is intact, so you know. Shark player's dives are slower, Turtloid doesn't use his meteor rain even on extreme mode where he normally spams the fucking thing, and Shield Shellon is missing his entire pre-desperation attack in the final game. All this stuff is pretty neat, but it's Gate and his stages that I want to highlight, because they really begin to open up some of the most fascinating parts of this prototype. Gate's lab cannot be accessed in this build by normal means, selecting it will crash the game. However, the data for some of these stages is still in the game. Thus, we can use cheat codes to play them. Right off the bat, Gate Labs 1 cannot be accessed even through cheat codes. This will completely crash the game. However, both Gate's Lab 2 and the final stage can be played. Gate's Lab 2's teleporters are broken, but every part of the stage can be accessed. And I couldn't get the cheats to work. The one for the first area of Gate's Lab worked fine, but the others didn't budge. I could get the final stage to work, and to quickly describe that, the beginning is mostly the same, but the teleporters leading to the boss refights don't work, nor does the Sigma fight, so we unfortunately can't really see what he might have looked like. Gate Lab 2, on the other hand, I can really only describe through the cutting room floor's write-ups, because even ignoring the problems I had with the cheat codes, I couldn't even find any video footage of these early versions of the stages. Most of the stage is the same, the nightmare rain from X's section of the stage is missing, and the gate fight is different because gate can apparently be harmed by normal means as well as destroying his orbs and sending them back at him. That's kinda it, but the final difference is one that's insane, because it's actually something still present in the final game. So Zero Nightmare and the first High Max fight are both hidden battles in X6, and they both level up as you collect nightmare souls just like every other boss. Coded fights against level 4, Zero Nightmare, and Max are in the game's data, but are inaccessible due to a design oversight, which auto-skips to Dynamo's fight once Gate's Lab is open, and one of the ways to open Gate's Lab is collecting 3000 Nightmare Souls, which is also the condition for every boss being set to level 4. For a more concise rundown of this, I recommend Hide a Beast's level 4, Zero Nightmare video where he explains it all as well as showing off the fight. However, in this prototype, while 3000 Souls does open up Gate's Lab, it will not skip to Dynamo, meaning you can fight level 4 Zero Nightmare and High Max. That's actually crazy. The fights are mostly the same as the final. Zero Nightmare doesn't have his proper colors, and High Max can be harmed by the Z Saber as X, whereas normally he's only damageable with special weapons. That's really the end of it. The only other thing really worth mentioning is that there's no extra collectibles like Heart Tanks or Sub Tanks. I think what's really crazy about the X6 September prototype is that it seems that in the game's development, so much of the crazy bullshit that makes the game so frustrating like lots of level design moments, nightmares, extreme mode health, that godforsaken climb and heat nixes level that literally doesn't even have its own fucking checkpoint in this build, is shit that was still present in the final. It also makes this game's selectable difficulties feel like a hotfix to issues that they believed would be too time consuming to fix for a game that was clearly just a cash grab. X6 had so many unique ideas that if nurtured by a team who cared about its quality first, could have made it feel like a truly unique and wonderful game. But I think this prototype sort of proves that from the beginning, this game was fucked because the people making it didn't care about its quality. But I mean, I can't complain after power tripping so hard on this build Infinity Maginia being so much easier, so, you know, gotta take what you can get.
And that's all we've got time for today. Of course, I'm sure as time goes on, more and more of these will continue to get leaked and made playable. Just a few days ago, a video was released showcasing never before seen early versions of Mega Man X8 cutscenes, which is crazy. This stuff always fascinates me. I love art and I love being able to see how it comes together as an idea is expressed and turned into something that people can experience, and nothing fulfills this better than these prototypes for me, especially since Mega Man is one of my favorite video game franchises. I might just do this again with other series, but for now, I think I'm just going to go back to my normal groove, so the next time you'll see me, it'll be for the Streets of Rage 4 review. Till then, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you have a great night. Take care.